Cool. So when I was asked to do this talk, I um, thought about several pieces I see in museums that I wanted to talk about, and uh, maybe some friends' work that really influenced me. But I was thinking about it, and I recently had read um, Evan Duvall's The White Road, and what I really enjoyed about it was that in, in a profession as artists where we are constantly required to be critical of ourselves and where we, it's good practice to be criticised by your peers, it was just such a relief to find something that was affirming. And it was amazing to read this beautifully written book by someone who works in porcelain, telling me the stories that I had been told as a potter growing up in Cape Town, but giving me the historical background to it. So, for instance, growing up in Cape Town, in an apprenticeship for six years with a crazy porcelain guy in like this ridiculous house, like with mountains, like it was like a landslide of porcelain. You'd be told stories about the emperor in China who wanted uh, blood red, a blood red serving dish, and this one serving dish had come out, and it was the most beautiful thing that had ever happened, and no one could figure out how to recreate it. And the emperor said, "On pain of death." you must recreate this colour for me, because it is exquisite. And the potter tried for years and years, and on a bound, in despair, threw himself into the fire, because he couldn't fulfil the emperor's wish, at which point the firing was complete, because it was a pig who fell into the fire, creating a reduction atmosphere, turning the copper from green to red, that produced the first Oxford glazes. So this is a narrative, and it's a myth that I was told as a child, which I absolutely fell in love with. And then I read in this book and I find the guy's name. And I'm just so like, oh shit, it's, it's a moment, it's a real thing. Here this guy, I'm going to say it wrong, I apologise, but P-O-U-S-A, Busa, Peyton say the pot is Ding Jen, threw himself into the fire, made the perfect pot. So there's these little moments like this in the book I really enjoyed. And then other stories such as um, the Dragoon Vases. Um, I was told about this Saxon king who traded his giants for the Vases. And I always thought, a, giants, really, and B, for vases. And then you hear about um, uh, Augustus the Strong trading 600 soldiers for 151 parts from Frederick Wilhelm II in 1717. And it's a documented moment. And that's where these myths come from. But it was just so wonderful reading this book, uh, an academic, like an academic research version of these stories. And it made me think about porcelain in general as a medium, which I use quite a lot. Um, because it is so loaded, it's, um, it's got so much history to it, how could you possibly make anything new with it? And if you did, wouldn't you even notice, because they don't necessarily know the history themselves. So, one thing that came up in the book was the way that porcelain and ceramics in general is a shorthand for heritage. So, you make something out of ceramic, immediately feels old, maybe it comes from a faraway place, you want to know maybe the story of it. And then you also realise that the history of porcelain is that of fantasy. So what, most one of its appeals in the same 1700s when it starts to come into Europe is that it depicts these faraway scenes. And like anyone making from an outside market with buyers who are willing to spend some cash, you give them what they want. So there's export ware, and then there's imperial Chinese ceramics. And for instance, the Percival collection at the British Museum is an exquisite collection of Chinese ceramics made for Chinese emperors. Whereas the stuff we might see at the V&A collection in export there is things made for foreigners who have no idea what they want or what they're looking at. So you have like misdrawn balls which they've never seen on coats of arms. You have like a shit ton of like peach blossoms and birds and carp because this is what they want. They want blue and white, they want exotic, they want the slightly erotic, there are some geishas, like it's all for the market. And it's in that mistranslation that I find great beauty. So I should remember to breathe. <laughs> um, and one of those moments of mistranslation is in perspective. So in Chinese painting, uh, the grounds are in one place. There isn't a middle, there isn't a front, middle, and background. It's all together. So when you have these perspectives coming to Europe, you see a pagoda the size of a person, and you think, oh, that's how big a pagoda is. You don't realise it's like an eight-storey building in a park. You think it's this man-sized thing. And then you have the Dutch going, pagodas, that's pretty exotic. They're kind of man-sized. What could they be? Maybe a vase. Let's make vases. They make like pagoda-sized, man-shaped vases, things. And then these tulip vases happen. And tulip vases are now like the Ferraris of Dutch 
Enlightenment um, status symbols. So you have porcelain, incredibly rare, you have the exotic, which everyone wants, and then you have tulips, which, as I think we all know from that horrifically written book, which I forced myself to get through, the tulip dealer book, um, were like the first, one of the first boom bust economies in Western Europe. So massive speculation, prices go up and down, and they're kind of like foreground what we're currently going through with our own economic crisis here. So I decided to make a tulip vase for these reasons, um, because they were a Dutch fantasy of a Western world, because they mimic um, the economic situation we currently find ourselves in, and also because I have a fantasy about being potentially Dutch. And that's where the fantasy, <laughs> this fantasy heritage thing comes together. So, having grown up in Cape Town, South Africa, and having no experience of Europe, my entrance point to Europe has always been through material culture, uh, viewing it or making it, or trying to understand where it comes from. So I'll just pass this around. So that's that, and then this is my imitation, or at least a reference to Delftware, which it isn't because it's porcelain, so it's more like Chinese porcelain, um, but it's what the Dutch were aiming for. So I'll pass this to you, and pass it around. So these are the things that come up in the book and the things that I've been thinking about for a long time and it was just really amazing to see it in paper, written poetically um, by a man who's obviously had a lot of thought about this. Um, a man in my tradition. And how are we doing? Oh, three minutes left, not bad. So, one of the things that comes up <coughs> is ideas of porcelain as purity in the book and this desire for purity. Um, and I think purity itself is an abstract, it's a universal concept. I think there's a certain Europe, a universal appeal to it. Um, but pottery is also incredibly local. You are doing it in a moment, in a place, and it might travel far and wide, and you might lose the context, but it does have an origin. So one of the things I made here was a porcelain object made with local clay that actually got outside of this very hotel about four months ago when we were renovating. Um, I wanted to contaminate the purity of porcelain with the local and give it a bit of um, something a bit more real, a bit more grounded. And then the last thing that really impressed me uh, with his practice is his emphasis on installation and making it difficult for people to access what you're doing. So uh, in one of his first installations at the Jeffrey Museum, Evan Duval hid pots in the rafters and people complained. It's like, I can't see your pots, how am I going to get to them? And he was like, not my problem, they're there, do what you want with them. And that's a real forerunner to his Signs and Wonders installation at the VNA, which is like three stories up on a red metal I beam, and you can only just glimpse them. And he talks about in that work making trying to reference objects through history that not in an overt way, but sort of like an aft image or a blur. So it's like you're looking at something through a mist or you've looked away and the image is still on your eyes. And you can see that in his current work where he's putting his porcelain behind uh, frosted glass to give these shadows, these shadow parts. And I just love that about his work as well. Um, but it also brings me to the idea of um, stacking and wanting to create piles of things. So I'll pass this over here. And that's something that I absolutely adore, is just making big piles of things. And if they're pots, even better. Um, and that's been a real movement in my practice, um, is starting to make installations. Uh, and making installations has allowed me to create these environments and these narratives. So I suppose to round this talk off, say especially with the porcelain chain, uh, it explicitly references a short story I've written at my last residency at the Florence Trust. Um, and it ties in all the ceramic mythology that I was given as a kid, especially around the Wedgwoods and the Darwins, um, who were related. And I kind of feel like we should acknowledge that the theory of evolution was paid for with pottery money. Um, and this narrative weaves my personal history with ceramic history. And it was amazing to be able to, be able to make objects that would ground that and give that narrative something a bit more real. Um, and so it was just an absolute pleasure to read this book. I'm not getting commission, I promise. <laughs> He's talking at the Literary Festival in Stoke and Trent um, next month, so have a look at that if you want to hear him talk about his book. Um, but that's how that has affected my practice. Thank you very much.